For five centuries, the crossroads of Europe and Asia has been known as Istanbul. Once, it was called Constantinople. A Christian island in a Muslim sea, it withstood every assault by the warriors of Allah. In 1453, the Sultan besieged the city with a new army, men sworn to lay down their lives for him. An army of slaves, they were the sword of Allah and the scourge of Christendom. In the 15th century, Christian Europe stared into the face of unholy terror. Rising out of Asia Minor like a whirlwind, the Ottoman Turks stormed into Eastern Europe. City after city fell. Christians trembled and the Pope called for a new crusade against the heretics of Islam. The Turks did not fear these holy warriors, for the Sultan had his own, his elite infantrymen, the Janissaries, respected by Muslims, dreaded by Christians, and surpassed by no one. Bukri Haidar was a Janissary, a slave, the personal property of the Sultan. Islamic law forbade enslaving Muslims, but not infidels. A 14th century sultan spared the lives of Christian soldiers taken as prisoners of war in return for their unswerving loyalty. Legend has it that a holy man dubbed them Yenicheri, the new troop destined to spread terror wherever they went. These were the first Janissaries. Whenever the Turks invade foreign lands and capture their people, an imperial scribe follows immediately behind them, and whatever boys there are, he takes them all into the Janissaries and gives five gold pieces to each one and sends them across the sea. The Ottoman Empire was soon growing faster than its army. In 1438, the Sultan levied a tax on every Christian family under his rule. The payment? One of their sons. Every five years, the Sultan's representatives scoured the countryside to collect the tax. He could not take an only son, nor a gypsy, since gypsies were considered unreliable but any other healthy boy between 8 and 18, like Bukri Haidar. From their Balkan villages, 2,000 recruits were marched hundreds of miles to the Sultan's court. At the Ottoman capital, Edirne, Bukri Haidar was rigorously tested in mind and body. How he fared would decide his service. The most gifted were sent to the Sultan's palace to be trained as his bodyguards. In time, many would lead his government and his army. The majority of slave boys were destined for the rank and file of the Janissary Corps. Bukri Haidar was first sent to the estate of a Turkish noble to work as a farmhand. 
There, he learned the Turkish language and faith, surrendering his Christian name for a Muslim one. Three or four years later, he returned to Edirne to learn a trade, masonry, carpentry, or blacksmithing. The future leaders of the Janissary Corps had a stricter education. Supervised by the chief eunuch, the boys were kept at the Sultan's palace under lock and key. For cadets like Bukri Haidar, training could continue for eight hard years. Wrestling, weightlifting, sword craft, lance throwing, horsemanship, and archery. They have the adroitness to shoot their arrows so very accurately that they hardly ever fail to hit man or horse. In 1444, alarmed at the spread of the Muslim Empire, the Pope declared a holy war. Against the Crusaders, Bukri Haidar would put his long education to the test. At the Black Sea port of Varna, Christianity and Islam met in battle. The Christian leader, the King of Hungary, formed his lines. On his right, mercenaries and French knights. On his left, soldiers led by Vlad II, the father of Count Dracula. Across the field, the Sultan likewise placed himself in the center with his trusted Janissaries. The Janissaries before him, and behind them the camels, and a trench is made up all around, and a rampart heaped up next to it. The Christians attacked. They charged the Turkish right so fiercely that the line broke. On their left, the Turks counterattacked just as hard. The battle went on until the afternoon, and heads rolled on the field like pebbles. By evening, Weakened and facing defeat, the Ottoman army took flight. Only the Janissaries remained. The Janissaries sought out a place at the foot of the mountains among some gorges and tall heather, so that the enemy could not notice that there was any trench before them. And leaving the first trenches, they pretended to take flight. As the Hungarian king pressed on, one of his generals tried to stop him. You don't want to fight the archers in the hills, for they will kill your horses and your men will be lost. No two Janissaries carried the same weapons, save for the bow. Bukri Haidar had long ago mastered the skill of archery. From far off, his arrows rained down on the Crusaders. The king marched straight upon them, wanting to crush them swiftly. Thus, this gorge became completely full of cavalry. Leaping out, 
the Janissaries beat them and killed them as they wished. In the thick of the fight, Bukri Haidar faced a resplendent knight. This Janissary, having noticed the fine armor and the feather and clasp on his helmet, cut off his head and brought it before the Sultan, and throwing it before him said, Fortunate Lord, here is the head of some famous enemy of yours. It was the King of Hungary. The Janissaries had routed the Christians, but the casualties were so terrible that the Sultan vowed, May Allah never grant me another such victory. Bukri Haidar was rewarded with promotion. Returning to his barracks, however, he lived a monastic life. As a slave, he was forbidden to drink, gamble, or marry. All his time was spent training for war. Better prospects would come only by distinguishing himself before his master, the Sultan. They have their task in common, at night to lie near the Sultan and take the night watch silently. Rain or snow, winter or blizzard, each must remain in his place. Each night, fifty, and one hundred when necessary. Even slaves had to be kept satisfied if their loyalty was to be kept. Bukra Haidar received an allowance for weapons, a bonus whenever a new sultan took power, and his regular wages. Wages are paid by the imperial court every quarter year in full and without fail, and it also gives them clothing once a year. The sultan's money was well spent. Fear preceded the Janissaries. Victory followed. Their very music, crashing cymbals and pounding drums, was dreaded. Unstoppable, they swept through the Balkans like a scythe. Bukri Haidar served under a corporal in a squad of ten, with its own pack horse, tent, and treasury. They are diligent and get up early in the morning. They are frugal when on the road and live on only a little food, a little badly baked bread and some raw meat. Their camps were well kept, their latrines well ordered, their ranks well disciplined. Cowardice, disobedience and desertion were punished by death. Yet so devoted were the Janissaries to Allah and each other that it was said 10,000 of them could be led by a thread. Nine years after the Battle of Varna, the Janissaries came to the last bastion of Christendom in the east, Constantinople. Like his forefathers, the new Sultan, Mehmet II, had long eyed this prize. Thirty years before, his father had tried to take the city and failed. Mehmet would prepare better. In March 1452, Mehmet Bey the Turk set about building a fine castle six miles from Constantinople, towards the mouth of the Black Sea. It had 14 towers, of which the five principal ones were covered in lead and very strongly built. And it was made for the express purpose of taking the city of Constantinople. Towering over the Straits of the Bosporus, this citadel blocked any ship from sailing into Constantinople. The Turks called their new fortress the Throat Cutter. Surrounded and outnumbered, 
the defenders of Constantinople placed their trust in a double wall, a hundred feet wide, surrounded by a moat. Against the Turks, it had always proved impregnable. By sea, the city was protected by only a single wall, but it too was unapproachable. A heavy iron chain slung across the narrow stretch of water called the Golden Horn sealed off the harbor from Turkish vessels. On April 2nd, 1453, the first troops came into sight of Constantinople. The Sultan approached and placed his forces so that they extended from one sea to another. On a hill near the city, the Sultan made his camp, ringed by thousands of his warriors. The ground was completely invisible, being covered with Turks, particularly the Janissaries, who were the fiercest of all the Turkish soldiers. The Turks unleashed a thunderous bombardment. Huge chunks of the city's walls collapsed. Under cover of darkness, the defenders rebuilt them. The Turks fared no better by sea. Their first attempt to capture the Golden Horn ended in disaster. Christian galleys showered them with burning arrows. Many ships were lost along with 12,000 men. Enraged, the Sultan had his admiral deposed and flogged and distributed his possessions among the Janissaries. As dawn broke on April 22nd, the Christians in Constantinople witnessed an act of sorcery, boats sailing on land. Since Mehmet's ships could not get past the chain guarding the Golden Horn, they would go around it. With horror, the Christians watched as the Turkish fleet slithered into their harbor. Bukri Haidar knew the great assault was coming. His spirit soared. Allah would make a special place in paradise for the first Muslim to set foot in Constantinople. All night, the Janissaries prayed and celebrated. One hour after dark, the Turks began to light a terrifying number of fires, much greater than they had lit on the two previous nights. But worse than this was their shouting which was more than we Christians could bear. At dawn, they heard a chilling sound. The Janissary musicians beating out the march of attack. day came, the cymbals began to sound and the pipers and trumpeters joined in, giving the signal for assault. After several hours of desperate fighting, the first wave gave up, exhausted. The Sultan turned to his Janissaries. My Janissaries, my children, you have shown your bravery wherever I have campaigned. Now, it is through you that the city will be captured. All now hung on them. They advanced, not rushing like the others, 
but keeping their ranks in perfect order in the face of arrows and stones, unbroken, undaunted. The Sultan himself rode out with a great array of troops. He chose to fight in front of the breach in the walls with a contingent of brave young janissaries. And there were more than 10,000 of them fighting with the courage of lions. Vying for glory, the janissaries hacked their way through the breach. Christians were pitted against the Christian born, now fighting for Islam. The cry went up. The city is taken. Having won honor, the Janissaries now sought plunder. Decades later, the Turks would still refer to men who owned wealth above their station as one who took part in the siege of Constantinople. The Sultan moved the Ottoman capital to Constantinople, renamed it Istanbul, and ushered in a golden age for the empire. Mehmet built a magnificent palace called Topkapi in its outer courtyards, the Janissaries trained. The empire grew ever larger, the demand for soldiers still greater. The Sultan needed more troops than the tax on Christian boys could supply. By 1600, Turkish citizens were recruited into the Janissary Corps. Soon, most were not converts like Bukhri Haidar, but native Muslims. The esprit of the Sultan's slaves was broken, their loyalty corrupted. For the next three centuries, the Janissaries dominated not the battlefield, but the court, fabricating intrigues with the women of the harem and plotting to assassinate Sultans. In 1826, when the reigning sultan tried to abolish the corps, the Janissaries revolted. The sultan retaliated by wheeling his cannon up to their barracks and opening fire. Most of the Janissaries were killed. The rest were taken to the public square and executed. What the Sultan had created, he destroyed. An army of slaves serving no one but him. Christ was crucified, the holiest site in Christendom was seized and defiled. The Pope beseeched all Christians to unite in a great crusade. Go forward boldly as knights of Christ, hurrying swiftly to defend the church. His call was heeded by a new order of knights who pledged their lives to retake the Holy Land. Warrior monks fighting for God and betrayed in the end by their own church.
In 1189, the Holy Land is a battleground. Two armies, Christian and Muslim, each fight with God on their side. At the place of honor in the Christian lines, Gérard de Rifour commands Allah's worthiest foe, the Knights Templar. These men, brave and rigorous in arms, have struck hard with frequent attacks, both secretly and openly, so that those who previously terrorized us now regard themselves as most happy if they are permitted to live in peace. So terrible are the Templars that the great Muslim general Salahadin, as generous as he is shrewd, has shown them no mercy. The fiery heart of the enemy, he calls the Templars. These, more than all the others, destroy the Arab religion and slaughter us. With fire in his heart, Gérard de Rifour prepares to lead his knights once more into battle. Seventy years before, the Templars, this scourge of God, was only eight men strong. On the road to Jerusalem, two French nobles saw the light. Hugh de Payon and Godfrey de Saint-Omer, traveling with six other knights, vowed to safeguard the progress of pilgrims to the Holy Land. Reaching Jerusalem, retaken from the Muslims, they hurried to the Holy Sepulchre, the very site, as all good Christians knew, where their Savior was crucified. There, as all good pilgrims did, they etched a cross in its stones. The Christian king of Jerusalem was so impressed by their piety that he granted them quarters in his own palace, itself built, it was said, on the site of the Temple of Solomon. The band of brothers came to be called the Poor Knights of the Temple of Solomon, the Templars. They took a vow of poverty and took as their seal the image of two knights sharing a horse. Nurtured by the Pope himself, the new order flourished. To buy their own salvation, noblemen gave the Templars armor, horses, and land. At bases throughout Europe, the knights enlarged their ranks and trained for battle. Soon, from their own storehouses and monasteries, the Templars were sending supplies and men to the Holy Land, the sons of nobles who had spent their youth preparing for war. Among them, a young Flemish knight, Gérard de Rifour. Gérard had gone to Jerusalem to claim his fortune, a rich bride. Before he arrived, his betrothed was sold to another man. Gérard now wed his fate to the Templars. Other knights hired themselves out as freelances. Other knights defiled themselves with wealth, pillage, rape. As a Templar, Gerard donned the white tunic of poverty, humility, and chastity. In 
a ceremony both secret and sacred, Gerard committed himself to God. You seek what is a great thing, but you see us from the outside. You cannot know the austerities of the order. For when you wish to be on this side of the sea, you will be sent to the other side. And if you want to sleep, you will be awoken. And if you wish to eat, you must go hungry. Now, decide, good gentle brother, if you could tolerate all these hardships. From this day, his life would be ruled by two books, the Holy Bible and the Templar Manual. Too much talk is not without sin. We altogether prohibit idle words and wicked outbursts of laughter. No brother should swear when angry or calm, nor should he ever say an ugly or vile word. Unlike other knights, the Templars cut their hair short and grew beards. And unlike other knights, they vowed absolute chastity, a vow reinforced by their pledge never to bathe or to change their sheepskin drawers. On a crisp morning in October, an order passed through their camp. Gerard de Rifour made ready for battle. He first donned a quilted jacket to pad his torso, then 20 pounds of mail made of thousands of interlocking ringlets, small enough to deflect an arrow. Over his armor, a surcoat to protect the metal from rain, sand, and the Mediterranean sun. Then a hood of mail to guard his neck. And last, his iron helmet. You could see there an incomprehensible number of armed men. There were so many shining coats of mail, so many glittering helmets, so many noble horses neighing, so many white mantles, so many knights of great probity and daring, so many banners that never had such a crowd appeared to be reckoned up. The Templars rallied by their Grand Master and their banner, black and white, a reminder of the battle between good and evil they were called to fight. Its motto stiffened their resolve, not for ourselves, but for God. Gerard led his Templars in prayer with the Psalm of David. Not unto us, O Lord, not for ourselves, but for God. The two enemies were as unlike in warfare as they were in faith. The Crusader knights fought at close quarters, hand to hand and heavily armed. The Templars fought as a formation. Their discipline was scorned by their comrades, but respected by their foe. Their first attack is the most terrible. In going, they are the first, in returning, the last. Lightly armed and cool-headed, the Muslim horsemen struck like hornets and fled just as fast. Unlike the Crusaders, they felt no shame in fighting at arm's length, nor in living to fight another day. The Pope would hear how his knights fought that day. On the 4th of October, we joined battle. Altogether, we were 4,000 knights and 100,000 foot soldiers. However, our enemy Saladin had 100,000 knights. Nevertheless, we were armed with the sign of the Holy Cross. 
The Templars charged. They held their lances low to pierce Arab armor. Coming to blows, they lashed out with their swords. Those who fell to the ground fought on with sword or axe. Victory or death or disgrace. Should any of them, for any reason, turn his back to the enemy, or come forth alive from a defeat, or bear arms against the Christians, he is severely punished. The white mantle with the red cross, which is the sign of his knighthood, is taken away, and he is cast from the society of his brethren, and eats his food on the floor for the space of a year. were disgraced this day. In their eyes, God fought with them. Allah abandoned his followers, and his followers abandoned the field. They fled before our swords, and we pursued them up to their very tents. We managed to kill 500 of Saladin's knights, far more than we had hoped. While we were engaged in battle with Saladin, 5,000 knights left the city and made a sudden attack on us. We still managed to hold up against Saladin on one side and offer courageous resistance on the other before retreating to our camp. But for God, our men were killed on that day. Among them, their grand master, Gerard de Rifort. Crusaders, food was scarce, disease rife. Christians died or deserted, but the Templars stayed. It was beneath knights to do such menial work as breaking down walls. Instead, they undermined Acre with money. With Templar gold, the Crusaders bought siege machines. Led by the English king, Richard the Lionheart, the Christians spent the summer of 1190 trying to breach Acre. They filled in the moat and brought up battering rams. They wheeled a siege tower toward the defenders, but the walls were too strong. After two years of holding out, the city was defeated by starvation. In July of 1191, Acre yielded. A month later, ignoring the Templars' advice, Richard pushed on to Jerusalem and was beaten. For another century, holy warriors battled each other for the Holy Land. Across the sands of Palestine, Christian armies, multitudes up to a hundred thousand strong, flowed and ebbed. Between the tides of invasion, the Templars held fast in their fortresses. No other knights knew the land or the enemy so well. As warriors and diplomats, the Templars kept the Muslims at bay. In 1291, a hundred years after the fall of Acre, the Templars were again fighting for the city, from inside. Unlike the defenders before them, they refused to surrender. Like them, they perished.
The Templar Code forbade the expense of burying a knight. Instead, his body should be thrown to the dogs. At Acre, the dogs ate well. With Acre went the Holy Land. After two centuries, the ordeal of driving a people from their own soil proved too great. 20,000 Templars were left in the land they fought for, their souls already departed. As an order, the Templars survived and thrived. While in Palestine, they had become skilled not only as warriors and diplomats, but as merchants. So rich had they grown that the Templars, sworn to poverty, were now bankers to Europe. Their power rivaled kingdoms. Now the very church for which they once fought so bravely turned on them. Philip IV, King of France, feared their power and coveted their wealth. With the Pope, he plotted their ruin. They're so outrageously proud that one can hardly look them in the face. Tell me why the Pope permits them to misuse the riches which are offered them in God's service. It is a pity, in my view, that we do not rid ourselves of them for good. In October of 1307, on the unfortunate morning of Friday the 13th, the Templars of France were rounded up. They were tortured until they confessed. Their crime, heresy. They were burned at the stake, and the proud order of the Templars went up in smoke. The Christian church had once condemned war until Christian soldiers fought for God. From the ashes of the Templars, this ember would smolder. The idea of a holy war a crusade, a time when God takes sides. In 1314, Jacques de Molay, the last Grand Master of the Knights Templar, was burned at the stake. Legend says he cursed the Pope and the King. Next year, he swore, I shall bring you to stand judgment before the Almighty. Within a month, the Pope was dead. Seven months later, the King of France fell from his horse while hunting and died. Perhaps God had chosen sides.